should be a savior, but until you see your sin as being egregious and scarlet and like crimson, you don't see the need for a savior. Proverbs chapter number 31 this morning. We've been going through a bunch of characters in our Bible, just regular old folks, not of any necessary fame or glory of them themselves, as occurred in Sunday school. What do you have and who are Jesus Christ? Uh, I like that term in the book of Isaiah, less than nothing. When you think about that, you're, you're less than nothing. How does that even happen? Only when God's teaching geometry, trigonometry, algebra 2, and cogent, you know, all those wonderful things that James wrote the code four years ago <laughs> with Copernicus, but less than nothing. You're on the negative side of the balance sheet. But through Jesus Christ, you're a son of God. You're washed, sanctified, justified. Thank God for it. Amen. Proverbs 31. I want to take a look at some, some women this morning in King James. Well, I know we don't preach about that much in our churches, and that, that's okay. But uh, I, I think it'll be good for you this morning. Be good for me. 31. The, the chapter, if you want to find out what a virtuous woman's about, you're going to have 32 verses starting in verse number 10, going all the way down to 31, about what a virtuous woman is in God's eyes. The Bible says this in verse number 29. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. So there's one that rises above the rest. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Thank you again, Father, for the morning opportunity to meet around your book. Thank you for the Sunday school hour and the admonition and the correction about being puffed up and thinking highly of ourselves when without Jesus Christ, there's, there's not much thought at all about us. On the backside of nowhere, the dust of the ground, Father, what, what is man that there are mindful of him? But thank you for those of us who are saved, that we are in your family for all eternity, sealed on the day of redemption. The blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, has cleansed us from all sin for all eternity. Thank you for that. Thank you we can call you Father this morning. Thank you we can commune through the power of the Holy Ghost around this book, and that you would teach and instruct us and exhort us, Father, and comfort us as you see fit this morning. And Father, I pray that you would get the all, the all the honor and glory and praise. Do it into your holy name. Thank you for how good you've been to us, Father. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I like unsung heroes. I know that doesn't sound very popular nowadays in the selfie and the me generation, but I like folks that don't get a lot of props, that just go off and, you know what, things just get done by those people. They don't have a name to them, they don't have any fame to them, you'll never see their name up in the marquee or, or in the lights, you'll never have those big spotlights which you see at the old Emmys or the Academy Awards and all that stuff. You'll never see them get all the popularity and the praise uh, of man. They're, they're just off doing what they're supposed to do. I like that. As I told my boss one day, and we were just chit-chatting a little bit, and he sat down. He, he was out in the Midwest. He came back to uh, see what I did, and I it just did a bunch of stuff. I've been doing it for a long time, but I should be kind of good at it. I mean, you know, I just can't be there and sucking a box and collecting a paycheck like Brother Mains thinks I do. But and he goes, you just did all that in three minutes? I said, Joel, things just don't happen. There are people that are unnamed, unnoticed, that get things done. You need folks like that. Uh, you'll never know this, per se, unless I say it to you, but now it's going to ruin her old gig, and sorry, Karen, for ruining your judgment seat rewards. But my wife gets here, she cleans the bathrooms. Uh, the vacuuming until the, the boys got uh, some skirts and some aprons on them. They were the, the vacuuming. I'll, I'd get here and do the vacuuming. I'm not looking for praise, I'm just saying things just don't happen, folks. But it's the ones that want all the name and recognition. That's the ones you kind of forget about real quick. You're like, oh, okay, man, he's just another blowhard and all that stuff. I, I like athletes that don't say much. Ozzie Smith was a shortstop for the, uh, the St. Louis Cardinals. He never said much about anything. Hall of Famer, one of the greatest shortstops of all time. Uh, if I asked you to name the three people that had uh, 500 home runs and 3,000 hits, you'd probably get maybe two of them because you heard of them, but you wouldn't get the third one. His name's Eddie Murray. You ever heard of Eddie Murray? When he gave an interview, when he gave an interview, he would never say more than about five words. Because it wasn't about him, it was about the team and about his performance, how he could help others be better and, and get better at their game and win ball games. They didn't, he didn't care about the praise. I like uh, Derek Jeter, one of the greatest shortstops of all time. I'm picking on baseball because that's the only sport God cares about. <laughs> Let's just get on the line, man. I mean, football, I mean, come on, that stuff's cool, and I played all sports and, you know, hockey and all that stuff, but God's, it's in the beginning, man, and God, God pitched the tent, man, that's just the way, he pitched the tent, that's just God, man, 
He's a baseball player. I know he is. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. And Derek Jeter, probably one of the, maybe one of the top 40 or 50 players of all time. When you hear him talk, did he ever blow his own horn? Did he ever take accolades and praise himself? Never. About the team, Mr. Steinbrenner, uh, Mr. Torrey, you know. He never took shine to himself. I like characters like that in the Bible. I like unnamed characters in the Bible. I like the ones where you can plug your name in like, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not the elect chosen before the foundation of the world. Yeah, I'm still on it from Wednesday night. It didn't go away in the last four days. Not the ones that God preordained that he picked. No, whosoever will. Well, as we get to it this morning, there's three women in your King James Bible that don't have a name. But God knows who they are. In these last few weeks we've gone through this, you didn't know much about Bezalel. You may have known a little bit about Ezra, but Ezra didn't get as much, he doesn't have as much swag as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the big boys, right? Well, I like when God takes just ordinary people, ordinary people who love him, just want to do something for him, and God says, I like that person. I can do something with him. And such as it is this morning. Let's do this. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter number 4. You're probably familiar with a few of these. We'll be doing a little bit of flipping, so I can't say there's any particular order, but that's the way it will roll. This morning, three women to take a look at. And I know women are supposed to be handcuffed to the, to the, to the stove and, you know, uh, given birth to a litter of children. So you can have a minivan and she can have a closet full of jean skirts. But all kidding, I mean... <laughs> It's weird how we've done this, man. We, we don't talk, you, know, you know why you don't talk about women, don't preach much about women from the pulpit? Because they embarrass us. They embarrass most men when it comes to spirituality and serving Jesus Christ and loving, loving the Lord and all that. They're the first ones to the tomb. They're the ones always ministering to them. They're the ones that are always there. But you say, now, we're not going tranny this morning. But put yourself as a man in this and say, man, how, these women, man, these are Old Testament women. They're not even in the body of Christ. You got no Bible, man, no, no, no seal in the day of redemption. Wow, maybe there's some attributes, some traits I can learn from, from these women that would help me in my walk with Jesus Christ. So the Bible says this in chapter 4 of 2 Kings, verse number 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets, uh, of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditors come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. What a horrible situation. Now, go with me to Isaiah 6. We'll, we'll run some verses and we'll make some comments here. A little bit different this morning, but that's okay. Isaiah chapter number 6. I want to say she's just a certain woman. Nobody in particular. Couldn't pick her out of a crowd. Not, not a special skin color, not a certain height. Uh, probably, as we can see, not a lot of money to her name. She's just an ordinary woman. She's a certain woman. Uh, maybe you think this morning that, you know what, I have to be special and clean up my act before God can use me. No, you do not. You have to have a willing heart and a willing mind and be available, and God can use you. You know what the greatest ability God's looking for in your life? Availability. Would you just be there and show up? Could you just po possibly say, Lord, what, speak, for thy servant heareth thee. That's missing in our, in, our, in our Christianity. Everybody wants to be the preacher, and everybody wants to be the, 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 the guy teaching Sunday school. Well, no, it's the ones that clean the toilets and vacuum the rugs and do all the stuff that you don't see. That's who God cares about. Do you remember back in 1 Samuel chapter number 30? And I know we're going to, Brother Bert, get ready for the concord, because it's going to fly this morning. The, uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter number 30. Remember when, when the guys came back, those uh, sons of Belial and all that, came back with David and said, those people didn't do anything. We went to the battle. We're the ones that fought. All they did is stay by the stuff, and David says, you give them as much as you got. You just stay by the stuff and let God take care and meet out the rewards as he sees fit, because he's going to look on the inside and not on the outside. Remember Samuel when he's going through in 1 Samuel 16, and, and, and he get all the boys lined up, and all, all the sons of Jesse lined up, Shammon, and all, all those guys, man, and God says, I refused them. I refused him. I refused him. And Samuel's like, we're running out of kids here. And Jesse's a little old, man. He ain't going to have another kid in the next nine, ten months. What's going on? Forty weeks, excuse me, nine months. And Samuel's going, well, what is going on here? And the Lord says, Samuel, uh, the Lord doesn't look like a man looks. He doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. Look what the Bible says to me over in Isaiah chapter number six. I like this, man. Would help if I got there, huh? Isaiah chapter number six. The Bible says this in verse number five. 
Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes has seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know what? That will help you with your puffed up nature. When you see the King high and lifted up, you'll go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who am I? Would you say Isaiah is a pretty good guy? Would you say he has a lot of uh, uh, swag in his book, man, 66 chapters, laid out like your King James Bible there from Genesis to Revelation? Would you say he's a pretty important prophet? And he saw the king and he goes, I'm in trouble. In fact, I'm undone. Look what the Bible says to me in verse number six. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the, tong uh, with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. Aren't you glad you're not an Old Testament prophet? And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Thank God the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't have to go get a charcoal briquette, man, and get my sin out of my mouth, man. What a crazy thing, man. The Bible says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Go to Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, please. What's this woman have to do with anything in 2 Kings 4? She's just a certain woman. No, no, no big deal. Not, not, no husband left. In trouble with the creditors, man. Just, just, a, just, just, just a nobody. Now, we had something that worked back in the day when you, when you had a layoff or you had a firing come, and they had a process called rack and stack. And what you'd do is you'd take your employees and you'd try to rack and stack them by their value, what they did, what they could do, their talent level, uh, how much money they made. That figured into it, man. If you'd been there 25, 30 years and you're making a lot of money, guess what? Well, we can do away with what you know and all that experience and all that because you're making too much money and you've been here a long time. You know, we'll, we'll get a young guy in at half your price which is stupid, by the way, because now that's what we have at work. you got a bunch of young people walking around like lemmings. and back, 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 back. Oh, hey, let's go, to, let's go to Starbucks. They put a Starbucks on my floor. I can't escape coffee. Got rid of it in church, and now they put it over there. And then they, they actually took a room where there was library and prints and engineering stuff. You know, stuff that was important, you know, like the building aircraft parts? Don't fly. Take a bus. Because the guys that are making parts now are drinking, you know, soy latte with raspberry egg froth whip. You're weird, man. And I'm listening and all, it's like the Breakfast Club, man, from the 80s, man. And I'm like, Molly Rigwald's over there, a few other, I'm like going, what are you guys doing? Like, Let's go have a coffee. And I'm like, <laughs> could we get some work done? But that's what happens in Iraq and stack. So, you, you know, Iraq and stack. But that's what we do in Christianity. This woman's a certain woman. She has no name. She has, she has, she has no power. She has no, no sway over people. She has no anything. She's just a certain woman. And yet, God's going to show her some great favor. If you were a rack and stack people, you'd look at her and go, who is she, man? Well, let's go shake hands with the preacher. Let's get the preacher to sign my Bible, because it's the preacher, the preacher, the preacher. Let's go talk to the pastor. How about talking to the person in the back that nobody wants to talk to? And minister them and deal with them and help them out. You might get a blessing out of that. You can't even believe that it'll take you out into eternity as the rewards of the judgment seat of Christ. We do the same thing in our own circles where we rack and stack people and think, well, they're the important, they're the anointed of God. They're the come on, man. If you knew what that preacher was doing the last six days, you wouldn't even listen to him. Not me, I'm saying the other preachers you guys listen to. It's just, but you know what? I like that. She's just a certain woman. And you know what Isaiah says? I'm a man of unclean lips. And the seraphim puts that hot coal on his tongue, purges iniquity, and then the Lord goes, hey, we, we, got, we got anybody that can go for us? And you know what Isaiah says? I'm right here. I'm, I'm, I'm available to be used of you if you will have favor with me to use me. Could you say that this morning, Christian? Could you say whatever you'd like, Lord? Uh, I'm available for it. Or do you have your do you have your schedule and your you know do you have your times? I, listen, I'm not against the schedule, man. Get get out of here with that foolishness. I'm talking about when God upsets your apple cart. Could you still go on forward for Him? Last week during Sunday morning after the Lord's Supper, I knew that was not what, this was not going to be preached then. I don't know how that worked out. I, don't, I hope it happens more often. I'm more in tune with God and less in tune with me. Whether you thought it was a good message or not, I don't really care. It's what God wanted me to preach last Sunday morning. That's what I'm talking about. Can God interrupt your life with what He wants and you say, Lord, I'm here. Not, Lord, i got other things to do. Isaiah said, here am I. This one, I'm just a certain woman, but I know where to go. 
I know that my old man, before he died, he, Elisha, he knew what to do, and he taught me, and I know where to go. She's just a certain woman on the backside of nowhere. Who cares about her? You think Isaiah would have wrote that book? You think Isaiah would have wrote that book if he had said, no, Lord, get somebody else. Get somebody else. Ezekiel 22, the Bible says this in verse number 30, and I understand we're jumping right in the middle of stuff and breaking all the rules, and that's okay. We'll make up for it tonight. Verse 30, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. He's, he was looking for somebody that could please hedge the gap, stand in the way to go before him and the people before he just absolutely eviscerated the whole thing. He's looking around for somebody, and he can't find any. He's just looking for a certain man, a certain woman that would stand up and say, you know what, I love you, Lord. I love your Bible, and I love what you've done for me, and whatever you got, I'm up for it. That willingness is huge in the life of a child of God, man. Every day you and I wake up, it's a battle of whose will is going to run the show. This foolishness we went over on Wednesday night. Are you telling me you did everything for Jesus Christ today that he told you to already in the last several hours you've been up? Don't tell me you don't resist his will all the time or most of the time. Don't tell me you and I don't have our own schedule and do what we want whenever we want, however we want. And God still, because he's mighty and kind and powerful and long-suffering, still lets us do it and doesn't crush us. Don't tell me you don't resist God's will or God's grace every single day. Sure you do. He's told you to go one way, you go another way. What do you think that is? Well, he's just looking for somebody saying, well, I, no, I, 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 Lord, you know, I'm, I'm, low, I'm so low. I can't be used. And, uh, you know, God's just saying, are you, are you willing to stand up and say, yeah, I'll make up the hedge. But who am I among so many? Nothing without me. But with me, boy, you could make up the hedge in a heartbeat. I like that. I like that right there, that word gap. You ever notice that word gap right there? People talk about no gap in the Bible, in the King, uh, King James Bible, Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2. There's always a gap. And Lord, the Lord's looking for somebody to stand in the gap. Uh, you, ever, you ever read that verse over in uh, Romans 12, 1? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto me, which is your reasonable service. And what does he, what's the next verse say? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? That you may pursue, uh, that you may, uh, that you may prove what is that what? What's the first one? Okay, how does that? What are those letters at the beginning of that? G A P. If you want to fill in the, if you fill in the gap, you'll perform the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. I learned that years ago. That's not from somebody else. So before Kenny wants to fall down and throw things at my feet, that's I learned. I learned. I learned that from. I'm lear, I learned. I learned it from somebody else. But you know who? Lear, know who you learned it from? Jesus Christ. You want to learn the good, excel, perfect will of God? You stand in the gap and say, Lord, I'm willing to stand in the gap. I'm just a certain guy. I'm nobody. I'm in Ellington, Connecticut. Who am I? How can I reach the world for Christ? How can I do this? You can't. But it would start with you being willing. And watch what God does. Maybe God didn't call you to reach the world. He called you to reach your neighbor. Well, I don't know. That's not really a really grand plan. It's grand enough to God, isn't it? So we, we get so bedazzled by this. This woman's just a certain woman. She's nobody. Who is she? She's, not, she's nothing, man. Just a, just a certain woman with no name. And everybody today, I've got to have a name, man. I've got to get, I've got to get my name in the paper, man. When you're, when you're a kid growing up and you're an athlete and you grow up in a family of athletes and everybody knew your brothers and all that stuff and you're the baby of the family, you were just scrambling to get some you know, press time, man. I'm serious, man. You come down the road, and you had a good game in Legion. You're scouring through the, the Keene Sentinel or the Brattleboro Reformer. They were probably Calvinists. The Brattleboro Reformer, and you're going down. Th that was funny right there. You guys missed it, man. You go down through that, and you're like, Dave Brown pitched one pitch, and it was a strike. You know, you're looking for anything, man. And then you clip out the whole section, and you glue that bad boy. Because you're looking for recognition. God's not. God's looking for anybody who will stand up and say, I love you, Lord. I love your book, and I want to just do anything you'd ask me to do. I'm just a certain guy out of nowhere, out of no, no time. You, would you use me? I'm here to be used of you. That's what God's looking for, folks. He's not looking for the most eloquent, the most fair of speech, the greatest Bible reader, and the wonderful memorizer of Scripture. And Boy, you can really put three points in a poem down to something about tithing. You must be a Baptist preacher. You're awesome. He's just looking, would you be willing? Could you just be a certain man, a certain woman to be used of him? But it's all going to come down to your will versus his will. And whether you'll just say, Lord, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm like Isaiah. I'm, I'm just here. 
I'm, Lord, I'll go. I'll go. Look what the Bible says to me. Give me give you one more. Psalm 94. Psalm 94. Psalm 94. Please. I like those questions in the Bible. Who will go for us and who will stand up for us? I, I like those verses, man. It gives me encouragement when I read them. Psalm 94. The Bible says in verse 16, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? He's not looking for you to lead 50,000 people to Christ. He's not looking for you to have great sweeping revivals. There's only been one Billy Graham. Probably never be another one like him. And you can rag on him all you want, and I get it. He, I understand all the doctrinal situations. But if you ever heard that man preach, you get some tapes from the 50s and 60s, that guy was off the hook. Off the hook about hell and Jesus Christ. And it wasn't all the, you know, settling people, his people through the crowds and getting them to come forward. That boy was preaching, man, and lighting it up. And you could see it in his eyes and hear it in his voice, man. That was burning in him, man. But there's only going to be one of those. You've heard me say before, there's only one Dr. Rockman. There's only one James. There's only one Dr. B. There's only one of those. But would, how did that start for those men that we look up to? I'm a certain man. I'm a certain woman. God, I'm nothing but you're everything. And I'm willing to be used of you. Here I am. Do what you will with me. I'm yours. And the question is, who will stand up for me against the evildoers? Would you stand up at work this week and say, you know what, homosexuality is wrong when they're all giggling and laughing about it? Or when somebody yeah. lights up a JC or a GD? I'm not saying you have to break out your Bible and get on the, you know, stand on top of the desk and start ripping into them. That wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad thing. That would be a good thing. It wouldn't be a bad thing if you do it. But I'm just saying, you could just say, well, if God damned everything, you'd be in trouble and you're condemned already because you believe not. Well, that's mean. No, that's how you interject there. Well, I have to be kind and loving. That is kind and loving. And sometimes, you know what? Put kind and loving on the back burner and say, my God says you're going to die and go to hell if you die in your sins. Well, that's mean. Not as mean as some of the stuff they say about my king and my God that we have to put up with. And God says, would anybody stand up for me? Would anybody go in front of the evildoers and say something? Would anybody just stand up and say, that's wrong, he's right? Well, that takes boldness, brother. And you need, man, a right, a bold as a lion. You can only be bold as a lion through the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he's looking for you to be willing to be bold, and he can do whatever he will with that. He'll empower you to do that. It's just a certain, she's just a certain woman. Who is she? I don't, even, I don't even know her name. But God put her in his Bible forever. Look at the Bible says to me over in 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. Nothing like the book of books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, boy. 1 Kings 17, please. Getting right into the crux of Elijah the prophet, probably the greatest Old Testament prophet. Even though Elisha did twice as many, Elijah seems to get all the, and properly so, he's going to come back in the tribulation period and all those, those wonderful things, but he, he's, he's the guy, but look, look at what happens to old Elijah. Verse 8 says this, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of uh, behold the widow woman was there gathering of sticks and he called her and said fetch me I pray thee a little water and a vessel that I may drink so he had a certain woman I call this woman a ready woman she's not just hanging around folks she's a ready woman she's actually out gathering sticks I mean honestly <laughs> Karen will go out and pick up the poop I mean, that's the best I can do with that verse, Karen, for you. I mean, but she goes out and picks up the poop. I'm, I'm glad she does it, because if I hit one of those landmines, I'm going to lose it. And, you know, it, and of course, you got the hiking boots on. It goes in between the crevices and all that. You're Kenny, you know what I'm talking about, man. And I'm not going out with that glove thing and picking it up. That's not happening, man. No, wait till it's hard and launch it. I, you get everything around here, man. But I, I'm just saying, she's out gathering sticks. A, a, a widow woman is just out there. You know what that's telling me? She's not just waiting around. She's, she's ready, man. She's ready for when Elijah shows up. She's already been working and laboring without a husband around, with no guidance to do it. Uh, part of that woman in Proverbs 31, doesn't she worketh willingly with her hands, makes sure her household all clothed with scarlet, brings her stuff to the merchant man, 
Go with me over to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. I think God saw this, this woman as a ready woman, and he said, you know what? I, got, I, I could pick a lot of women, but I'm going to pick this widow woman because she's out. She's already she's laboring. Man. She's ready. She's not just hanging around. You say, you say, what's that got to do with the first point, preacher? You want to be that certain one that's just willing. But there has to be some preparation in that. Do you think a preacher just happens to be a preacher? Do you think a pastor just happens to be a pastor? No, it's a gift from Almighty God. Do you think that a, a and I'm going to use this term loosely, do you think a good soul winner becomes a good soul winner by not doing some witnessing and praying and soul winning? You've got to be that certain one, but you also, there's some preparation. So when God looks down and says, you know what? I've seen what's going on there, and I've watched them, and I've made a judgment that that person would be able to handle what I'm about to lay on them through my power and strength. You say, that's crazy. Okay, well, look at 68, verse number 5 with me. 68, 5 says, A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. He looked down and saw that widow and said, I judge her. She's faithful. Look at that. She has, she has no husband. She has no husband. She has a child still. She's a single mom. And she's out gathering sticks. Why is she gather sticks? Because she's making ready, because she's got to make food. She's not just hanging around doing anything, uh, doing nothing, man. She's actually preparing herself. Uh, a lot of folks will say this, well, I'd like to know the Bible like that. That has nothing on me, that's just what people say. I'm serious. Well, do you think that magically happens? Do you think you just lay down with a Bible on your pillow and just hope it seeps into your brain? Well, I'd like, to be a good, I'd like to be a good preacher one day. Do you go and preach? Well, I don't get much chance in the pulpit. There are so many pulpits around this town and this neighborhood, you can't even name them all. Do you think you're going to increase in your preaching and your wind and your ability to preach and talk to folks and, and exhort from the Word of God if you don't preach the Word of God? I, I, I know, man. Well, I'd like to be a great soul winner. I'd like to be, well, okay. You got to be that certain woman, but how about we do some preparation in all that too? That woman says, "I'm not. I, my, my husband's dead. I got. I got. I got a boy. We don't have much food. In fact, this is just about it, man. But you know what? I'm not going to hang around. I'm going to go gather some sticks." And God looked down and judged that widow and said, "You know what, Elijah? I have there a woman. He already saw the woman. Says, I've got a woman there that's going to take care of you. And I'm going to work a miracle through her. I like that. Go over to First Timothy chapter number one. First Timothy chapter number one." I'd say the Apostle Paul was a pretty faithful dude. Do you realize he was faithful in murdering saved people? Do you understand he was faithful before he got saved? That, I'm telling you what, man, you, you can name all the attributes of a human being you want to name. I'll tell you what, faithfulness and rate, if you put a little slash on that, consistency. That to me means everything just to show up, to be there. Well, you don't have the right attitude. I know, could you just show up there? Maybe God will change your attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just be there? Can you just show up? Can you be ready to show can you just? Can you, just shh, can you be in the place where you're supposed to be? That, man, that resonates with me more. I mean, it's almost akin to loyalty. You folks have been in the military. I was never in the military. You know what it's like to have somebody you can count on, that you can trust in your platoon, your barracks, whatever the case is. That's the same thing that God's looking for. He's looking around saying, man, when the Son of Man comes, I know it's the end of the tribulation period. Going. He goes, well, the Son of Man, when he comes, will he find faith? Uh, but a faithful man, who can find? Is there anybody around that would just be consistent? No, it's hit and miss. I do this when I want to do, and I do it. No, it's consistency. And your inconsistency affects others around you. I don't care what you say. Well, they should run their own. I know you're supposed to run. I, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But when you see other folks unfaithful, you're like, well, what's the big deal? They're unfaithful, and they're, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be affecting them. So let me just peel away, too. I'm telling you, it has an effect on yeah. other folks around you. And this woman, she's out. I have no husband. We're about to die. We have nothing to eat. You know what? I'm going to go gather sticks because whatever we do have, I want to be ready. And then the Lord says, you know what? There's a... Oh, she doesn't have a name either. She's just called the widow of Zarephath, just an ordinary person. And the Lord says, yeah, Elijah, I've got a woman over there, a widow woman, and she's going to take care of you. And Elijah's probably going, really? 
I mean, seriously, a, a widow woman? This is how this is going to roll? Look at the Bible says to me in 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Verse 12 says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in, in un unbelief. Do you realize that as a lost man, Saul was more faithful than most saved people are today? Do you know that he thought he was doing God's service, going out and hauling and hailing men and women into prison and killing those folks? Do you realize how much he thought he was serving God during that and he was lost? You say, what's the big deal about that? I think when you're faithful in your work and you're faithful in your maybe your family, right, and you're lost without Christ, I think that thing goes in a supercharged, stinking turbocharged through the roof when you get saved. It should. Because you can be so faithful for all, for all that stuff without Jesus Christ. Then when you get saved, you're like, wow, what a wonderful gift I've been given. And if I spend all that time pursuing all that garbage that's vanity, I sure can pursue something that has eternal weight and glory to it. Uh, that's where saved people, another place where saved people fail. They don't, they, don't, they don't see the eternal weight and glory of a thing. And they'd rather invest in the temporary, or they'll go, at, they'll go hard at their job to please their boss, which you should. And you'll work hard to get a paycheck and all those things, but you won't put the same effort and more into your Savior, Jesus Christ. That bothers me a lot. My job is not my life. My career is not my career. But I go at it hard. I'm going to do the best I can to improve the company, make the plan we have to make, and to please my boss. But I'm, I'm there to please my boss, who's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And if I can be faithful in that secular foolishness, I can't be faithful in the things that actually have some eternal weight to them. Paul says, man, I was so faithful to track those folks down. I was so faithful to do against God wicked things man, I can, sh I can sure turn it up a notch now that he's my Savior. Well, this woman's just out gathering sticks. Well, who would think about gathering sticks? What's the big deal about that? God thought it was a big deal. He's going to send his number one prophet that way. So you're a certain woman, a ready woman. Now give me, give me this one, 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, please. The only time this term occurs in the King James Bible is pretty neat. Second Kings 4.8 says this, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. That phrase is only used in one time. It's right here. And she constrained him to eat bread, and so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. I like that. When God gives you accolades, it's coming from a real source. When God actually stands up and says, that's a great woman, he knows everything about her. How about in John chapter 1 with Nathaniel? And uh, Nathaniel says, man, I, I, I know you're the Son of God. I, I know you're the Lord. And Jesus says, man, because, you, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? And you know what Jesus Christ said about Nathaniel before all that? Behold, an Israelite in whom is what? The God of glory said there's no guile in that man. When he knows your heart, your thoughts, your intents, how about Job? Hast thou considered my servant Job? Job? I hope you don't consider my servant Job. I don't think he knows where he's at. Oh, that's Job Biden, sorry. I, if, you consider, if you consider my servant Job, God knew everything about Job inside and out. And he says, man, I don't have anybody like him. How about the Lord Jesus Christ? Philippians chapter number 2. He made himself of no reputation. What I'm saying to you right here is you have a certain woman, you have a ready woman, and you also have a great woman. And if God gives you the accolade and God gives you that, that press and God gives you that title, then you are that, but just remember who it came from. The ability and the glory that God gave, that name that he gave to that woman, pretty neat. Now, go to 2 second, second Kings chapter number 4. Now we'll get into it a little bit. 2 Kings chapter 4. 
Look at verse number nine. We're, we're right here. Verse number nine says this. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which path by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. And let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. Now while you're right here, go with me over to verses 18 and 19. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. He said to the lad, carry him to his mother. Now, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this in a minute. The, these, women, these women have no husband. Or if they do, they don't, he doesn't seem to be interested. Now, bear with me. Go to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 1. And there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of prophets unto Elisha, saying, thy servant, uh, thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest thy servant did fear the Lord. And uh, the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Go back to 2 Kings chapter 17. I know we're going back to these three spots. I'm trying to time it out so it works where we end off. We can start the next section. Go back to 17, please. 17, 8, 9 says this, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get to Zarephath, which belong to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. These women, and I, it's, it's a problem. Even today in our, in our society, women that are alone, they have no husband because the husband died, or the husband seemingly doesn't care. I don't get that. If you, if you have kids as a father, you're invested in them. I see. I remember that passage right there. We just read about my head, my head. I think about the fly ball I hit the tailor that day back. In the, I'm thinking, oh no. I'm like, oh Lord, please, just can we go back in time and erase that one? I got it. I got it. Boom. <laughs> but the the point being about that, you know, she has no she has no mail there. You can say, well, I'm a strong woman. I can do it all myself. Listen, there's a reason why he put male and female together. Okay. And you can say you're strong and all that stuff, but the reality is women are different than men. Yep. Don't care what the drugs say and the surgeons say and all that stuff. They, there's a difference between a male and a female, particularly after the fall in the garden. And I see that guy there where the, the, the son says, my head, my head. And what's, what's the guy say? Take him to his mom. No, knucklehead, you have a responsibility in that child as much as the woman does. So these, two, these three women either have no husband, they're widows, or there's one that doesn't even care. So if you've got kids, you are responsible to take care of them. But your kids cannot become your idol. The ranking in a family is Jesus Christ first, your wife second, and if you have children, they're third. The kids don't override your wife or your husband. See, now that, see, see that it's silent here. I know it's boring this morning. I get it. I'm already feeling it. Don't worry about it. That's okay. Not every, not every message is a home run. That's okay. But I'm just saying to you is that when you go through this thing and you think about the, 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 the man, he doesn't want to have any part of that thing. He turns it over to the woman. No, you have a responsibility to take care of your kids, man. You don't dump them off to your woman. You don't turn your paycheck over to your wife. Oh, okay, well, now, now, see, now I'm going to get angry. All your TV and your shows make the man to be a schlub and a loser. He doesn't care about the kids. He doesn't care about the wife. The, the girl or the boy can come home with a, you know, all just freaked out, pink hair, lesbo, queer, and the father goes to his man cave. Yeah. And the father doesn't care, squat about how the money gets spent or the discipline in the house or any of that stuff. And well, well, you had a part in that kid, right? You have a part in this marriage. Right? You're the head of that household. Now, for the ones that are widows, I understand they're left in a different situation. I'm talking about the one that he's right there. He's like, oh, my head, my head. Well, yeah, well, you know what? Hey, you're one of my coworkers, you know, the guy I employed in the field, a lad, why don't you go take that sick boy, my son, to his mom? No, why don't you do something to help that kid out? You say, what do you get out of that? I'm, like, I'm looking at it going, we're, we're such a weird society now where men don't want to be fathers and they don't want to be husbands. And everything, you have women run churches. You have women run senates and women run... God. I didn't say women are not important. Don't read that into that. I'm saying that the males have shrunk away. I'm glad we have males in this church that read their Bibles, that pray, that witness. That's a huge thing nowadays. Your churches for the last 25 years have been woman influenced and women run. And even if the man's up in the pulpit, you know who really gave him that message to preach, right? The woman did. Because I don't want, and I wouldn't say, 
You think you could preach this with the average woman just staring at you like this? That's why you got your woman, uh, what's, that, what's that, the woman that looks like a joker with the wax red lips there? I, I always forget her name. Joyce Meyer, freak show. Sit down, shut your mouth. Uh, and just go down, Paula White, all the other ones. I don't care who you pick. Just get them all. Uh, Juanita Bynum. That was Carlos's girl back in the day, man. Juanita Bynum. The, pro, the, prof, the prophet's Juanita Bynum, man. Sit down and shut your mouth, woman. But I actually want to say that to the man. Stand up. And take your place that God's got you to lead your family. You don't have to be a dictator about it, but lead your family. If your wife doesn't like what God told you to do, then you know what? She needs to get right with Jesus Christ. You've got to do what God told you to do. This guy's like, my head, the, the kid's dying. And he's like, yeah, you know, take him to mom. What? Don't you have any wherewithal or care for your kid? When it says, well, let's go, let's go build a, a place for the prophet, it the guy doesn't even really offer to help. It's like, I can see her, man, going to Home Depot, man, getting the old 18-volt Makita, man, or they're probably up to 36-volt now, man. <laughs> yes, you know, man. I'm just, I'm just saying, man, those Cobra things are phenomenal, by the way. I was looking at those. I'm like, I'm coveting after those things. Man. The, oh, man. Was, thanks. Thanks for spreading the sin around if you're preaching. <laughs> no, these, these Knipek, uh, we'll talk about tonight, man. But I'm, I'm looking at this going... So, the, 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 they either have no husband, or the one they do doesn't care. These women are, let's say, you say, what do you get out of that preacher? I'm glad you asked. Go to Proverbs 6. Go to Proverbs 6. I'm glad you asked that question. I just got all the, the uh, suggestions in the suggestion box. Proverbs 6. You know what? Whether, I, I'm going somewhere with this, with this the particular point. You're going to have to do some things alone with your God, yes. whether anyone around you wants to serve him or not. You're going to have to go street preaching when nobody wants to go street preaching. You're going to have to witness to your neighbor when nobody wants to go door knocking with you. You're going to have to pray when nobody else is praying. You're going to, you're going to have to get like Elijah, even though Elijah had 7,000 men that hadn't bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So I'm the only one that preaches and cares. Well, you're going to have to be the only one sometimes. And it will start solo one-on-one -on -one between you and your God. Look what the Bible says to me in Proverbs 6. I know you know this verse. Verse 6 says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provider the meat in summer, gather food in the harvest, and that's, I was kind of excited there. How long wilt thou sleep, O slugger? When will the rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little fall in the hands of sleep, so that poverty come as one that travels and I want, as an armed man. This ant does whatever the ant has to do. And you know what? Did you see what gender she was? In other words, she goes and does the work. She doesn't care what the rest of the ant hills do. She's going to go provide and do what she has to do. Just like that woman was going to take those sticks and make a fire and make, take that last bit of food and say, my son and I are going to do it. In other words, I'm going to do what I have to do for Jesus Christ, whether anybody comes along with me or not. Folks, the Christian life, the concentrated Christian life can get very, very lonely because you really find out who your true friends are in the Lord and who were just tag-alongs. But when you draw close to Jesus Christ, Things are going to peel away, folks. We sing the song, and the things of this world become strangely dim, but the reality is I don't get close enough to him so that these things become strangely dim. But when you do, and if you choose to do that, and you get close to the Lord, things will peel off from you, man. And you'll have to be like that ant who says, I don't care what any other, what any other ant does, I'm going to do what the Lord would have me to do. Whether I have a husband, don't have a husband, or whether I have a husband who's a loser, but he claims to be saved. That sickens me, that you've got a saved husband, he could care less about Jesus Christ. I know we make fun of it, but it's sad. Most of the ladies in most churches, unfortunately, are the spiritual ones. They do read their Bibles, what we were talking about last week. The problem, why, why don't you know the Bible better than your, 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 your wife? She's supposed to come to you to learn that Bible, folks, if you're men in here. That's 1 Corinthians 14. And the men could care less. They're too busy doing whatever they're doing and not doing much for Jesus Christ. It's a strange, strange thing, man. Go back to me, uh, back with me to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. I'm going to say this. They love their children. you got a weird situation going on. And I know, I understand that things have changed. And I'm, I'm going to say this, man. I don't care how many kids you have or don't have. It's not a preacher's place to tell you have kids or not have kids. 
It's not a preacher's place to tell you where to send your kid, whether you homeschool them or you send them to public school. Not a preacher's place to say that. Not a preacher. Well, you better have your quiver full of them, bro. Yeah, a quiver can have one arrow in it. What happens if God only gives you one kid or doesn't give you any? Well, I just believe 15 was the number. Yeah, three times five, they're going to kill you. <laughs> or 18, three times six. So I'll pick a number. I'll come up with something to destroy. I'll come up with something to destroy your whole family plan. I'm just saying it's crazy, man. But if you do have children, you ought to love your kids. Yeah. This weird thing of just having kids that have kids. We've seen it for years in daycare. They have kids because they become fashion items. Yes. Because other people have kids. And it's the cool thing. Hey, I have kids. Like, you know, I have a rabbit's foot. And I have a pocket full of change. Oh, and I got some kids over here, too. Because you got to have kids to go to, so not to soccer, to baseball. So, All right, I mean, yeah. but you got, you got to have kids because kids, you know, kids, that, that, you know. No, listen. If you're going to have kids, you ought to love your kids, man. Yeah. Don't reproduce if you're not going to love them. Right. Don't reproduce if you're not going to invest in them and spend some time with them. Yeah. They're your responsibility. They're not your showpiece. These women loved their kids. Even with no husband around, or if the husband they had was a loser. Look what the Bible says to me. In, oh, let's go to 17, verse 12. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two six that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. She could have said, no, this is all for me, nothing for you. Yeah. I remember years ago, there was a lady, I don't know, I think it was Pam Smart or whatever, she wasn't too smart, but she, <laughs> she put her kids in the back of her car, and I think she put a brick or a cinder block on the accelerator and drove the kids to a lake. Yeah. You see stories about women taking their kids and drowning them in a tub. Yeah. I mean, I've gotten that close mentally, just saying, Hale. I'm just saying, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, I'm just, I'm just saying, man. You, you, but uh, to actually go that far and actually kill your kid? Why'd you have them? Or running your, letting your kids run amok in the store and going off the wall on an airplane? Might as well get it all out there right now. Or other stupid things you let your kids do. Don't you love them enough to restrain them? Don't you love them enough to discipline them and try to fashion them in the right path? No, you don't love them because you just had them for it was something to have so you could say, I, I have kids. No, you don't. You got showpieces. These women, she goes, you know what? I don't have any food left. But whatever food I have, it's me and my son. And you know, if it comes right down to it, I'm going to give it to my son. Because I love, I love him more than I love me. That's the ministry. You got to love those around you more than you love yourself. And that is not easy. Second Kings chapter 4. Second Kings chapter 4. Hope you're keeping all of Frank's nice glow-in-the-dark markers and all these here. See, now you know why he gave those, mar those bookmarkers out before he left. He's like, you don't need these. <laughs> 2 Kings 4, verse 4. Frank, that was a plug for your store, man. I hope you make a million. Hope you make a million and tithe off it, brother. 4-4. Uh, 4-4 four, four, four. Four, four says, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. I like that. Her sons are with her. She has no husband. And our son, she's taking care of, he says, well, that happens all the time. No, it doesn't. Kids are abandoned every day. Get up to the street, giving up after school. No, oh, they live in the house, or excuse me, they occupy in the house, but mom and dad could care less about them. Not, th not these women. Not these women, man. Man, you never seen me run so fast I ran out after Taylor got bonked in the squash. Man, I was freaking out. Haley, Haley was like, oh. I was like Deion Sanders, man. Yeah. Boom, I was out there. And I was like, you should have caught that. <laughs> you don't catch it with your head, dummy. <laughs> All I could think of, she got it in the eye. Yeah. And I hit a moon ball. I mean, that, tell you, that was... That was your... <laughs> <laughs> don't come tonight, you're banished. That was a... It was, I didn't mean to hit it that high. I'm just a superhuman special athlete. <laughs> See how you turn, you can turn around, you can turn around any rainy day, Tay. And it came down, she's like, she's got it, she's got it, boom. I'm like, uh, my head, my head. And I'm like, boom, I'm out. I ran. Haley's dialed 911 to get me arrested. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's nothing you guys can do that we haven't done as a family. I don't know if you know that show, uh, that show, that was, it's a horrible show. It's a donkey. It's called, the show was called Jack. The Brown family invented that. Yeah. If there was internet, we'd be gazillionaires. 
You go, oh, oh, hey, let's push somebody. Let's go fight a bull. Okay, my brother used to creep in at night when I was sleeping and push my soft spot in when I was a baby. <laughs> How do you know that? I got cameras, man. <laughs> Our family is wild, man. It's you know, like, oh, we invent something, put it on MTV. We're, we're famous now. We, we, that's old hat. We were inventing stuff to do to each other. Anyway, sorry, my head, my head. There's nothing, you, yeah, the Brown family is kind of interesting. It's a pack of hyena, hyenas, as I like to say. Paul and his sons Bora shall pour out into these vessels, verse 4, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Verse 5, so she went in from, so she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons. Her sons are with her. She loves these kids who, bought, who brought the vessels to her. So they actually helped their mom who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. While you're right here, go to verse number uh, 20. Go to verse number 20 while you're here. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, she sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. She called unto her husband and said, send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses that I may run to the man of God and come again. Why does the woman have to take the lead? She, lo she loves those kids. I mean, a father's love is, is, is very cool. And I'm glad I have the father's love. But there's something about a mom with a kid. I mean, it's just, it's just there's something about it, man. The dad will usually say, brush it off, get back in the game. The mom says, oh, i got to get a Band-Aid and some Neosporin. Here's a cookie. And, you know. That's just the way moms roll, man. You know? For her, it was a pan of Mexicorn. And <laughs> so, uh, you got to get Mexicorn. Anyway. But they, they love you. You're, you're, you're in a society now, man, where it's, it's on, um, we're not going to go there because we don't have time to do it, but Romans 1, women leaving the natural use of a woman Men with men working that, which is unseemly, and loving it. And they take pleasure, and the folks, that they take pleasure in it too. And God says, it's vile. Women leaving the natural use of, well, I don't, I don't believe a, man, a woman is placed in the house. Titus says that she's a housekeeper and a lover of her husband. See, again, society go, tells you to go contrary to the Word of God. And the woman who's prideful, like the man is prideful, the woman says, you know, I don't know a man tell me what to do. Okay, then you're out of line with Jesus Christ. You're out of line with the book, sister. No, I don't have a husband worth following. Well, maybe if you got your heart right with Jesus Christ, he'd want to fall, and you don't have to run your yap about it. They shall be one without the word, their conversation without the word. Don't say a word. Just have a testimony for Jesus Christ and be consistent. You watch what happens to that man. That's over in 1 Peter chapter number 3. Now, go back to, go back to where we were. Well, we're right there. Look at verse number 20 in 2 Kings 4. The Bible says, and when, I know we just read it. I'm not being redundant for the sake of being redundant. When he, uh, he had taken him out and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Go back to chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. There cried a certain one of the wise of the sons of, of the, uh, sons of the prophet unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. Thy creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bond men. Now, Go back to 1 Kings 17, please. I'm trying to take these passages apart just so you see how cool this is, where these are just three women, man, three ordinary women. They have no name. They have, they have no fame to them. They have no, they have no anything. Verse 17 says this, 17, 17. It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. I want to say this. They all face tragic situations. I have never lost a child. Quite bluntly, I don't want to lose a child. I know we say this, and it's true to some extent, that the natural course of life is the kids bury their parents. That's typically the way it's supposed to go. Well, you have to go to a funeral and see that little casket, and you see that kid, and you know when they died, Probably most of those little kids without the age of accountability, where they went home, they went home well, not, they didn't go home sin, they didn't go home saved, they went home safe. And you see some of those kids, those little ones, and you see that little casket and all that, and you see the people just losing their minds, and I don't blame them one bit. That's not a good time to drop Romans 8.28 on somebody. And you see those parents losing their minds, and the mom probably will be overtaken with grief more because of obviously carrying that child and all those things and the nurturing and all that stuff. And you see, you just see the, the horrible sorrow. And you don't, you don't get a lot of that sorrow in these passages. 
But I want to say that these women face tragic events. You and I face tragic events as safe people. Uh, we got a call this morning. One of Karen's uncles died, one of the remaining uncles. Pro I, I don't know for sure. We've talked about it before, prayed for him many times. Don't know if he was saved or not. He went off to eternity. He went, or, went off to either God's heaven or devil's hell. And you can just get real cold about that sometimes and just brush it off. But that bothers you because you think about the soul. Yeah, you'll miss him physically, but I think about the eternity, man. If they die without Christ, the minute they left that body, they went right to hell, and they'll never get out to the great white throne. And you think about all the times you could have witnessed to them a little bit more, maybe prayed for them a little bit more, maybe been a better testimony for them a little bit more. And you think about that, and, and you, you get consumed with all that stuff, man. And you don't, you don't get a lot of that in here. What surrounds the death, it just, yeah, went on her knees, and she held him till noon. He died. And then the one, what about the one that we're about to be sold to creditors? How would you like to have your kids taken away from you by Amex? or Visa, or MasterCard. And the Lord looks down and sees that situation and goes, man, why did you get yourself in such a debt? But no, you gotta be, you're borrow servant to the lender, and this situation, we're taking your kids as payment. That's some rough stuff. You know what? You and I are gonna go through tribulation to enter the kingdom of God. You, are, you and I are gonna face difficult situations. Is it gonna make you or is it gonna break you? I don't know. I wouldn't blame a lot of people now. It's been several years now. You learn and you watch over. I, I, I don't get so much on people as I used to. You don't know what they're getting ground down about. You don't know, as Dr. Peek, I would say, what they're carrying in their saddlebags. You don't know. Like that woman on the street says, could you, pray for, could, you pray for my, could you pray for my daughter? She's in Seattle and she's dying of cancer giving birth. That's a pretty heavy doubleheader. And you don't, you don't really know what's going on, and you see these situations here. You go through that stuff every day, whether, it's, whether it might seem minimal to somebody looking out into your situation. It's big to you at the time you're going through it. Yeah. These women are going through it, boy. But you know what's interesting? They all know who to turn to and what to turn to. I like that. Now, that being said, while you're in 17, look at verse 18. 17, 18. And she said to Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Quickly, go over with me to uh, 2 Kings 4. Back where we were, 2 Kings 4. 2 Kings 4. The Bible says this in verse number 11. It fell on a, it fell on a day that he came thither... He turned in the chamber and lay there, and he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto, said unto him, now, this is Elisha talking to Gehazi. And he said unto him, say now unto her, behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman could see and bear a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. Now, quickly, go down in verse number uh, 28. Verse 28, same chapter. Then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? You say, what's this got to do with they? They all, they all doubted. They all doubted. They all doubted in their tragic circumstances. Nothing will cause you to doubt like going through a hard time. I'd like to say I always live by faith. I don't. I walk too much by sight. I don't trust God when things get tough. I trust Him for my eternal soul, but I don't trust Him when the storm comes. How many times did those boys have to see Jesus Christ do a miracle with a dead body? A deaf man, a blind man. And they're in the boat, and the water is just swamping them. And he's asleep in the back, and they're going, don't you care that we're perishing? And he says, oh boy, here we go again. You just, you just saw me make mud and heal somebody's eyes. You don't believe I can calm the wind in the sea? And he stands up and says, peace be still. You see, tr tragedy brings out what you really believe about Jesus Christ, what you believe about that Bible. It's not really the easy times, because they're easy times. You can get unthankful in easy times, but when hard times come, that really shows you how much you trust God. And don't think hard times is, you know, I couldn't afford a new car. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm talking about they just lost a child. I don't blame them for doubting the man of God, the prophet of God, the preacher of God when the tough times came. I don't always live by faith. I don't, I don't always trust the Lord. All those, all those Bible verses, you know what? All of a sudden, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So it without, faith it's impossible ple- without faith, it's impossible to please and all stuff. I know the verses, but I don't know them until I have to live them. And I'm telling you right now, tragic circumstances will try your faith and your belief in God. And they're meant to. It's the trial of your faith. When things are going smooth, you don't think much about it. I honestly think that sometimes God does interject a hospital visit, a bad report from the doctor, just to see and try our faith. You say, that's mean. No, that, did you see what he did to his son? Did you see what he did to a perfect man, a sinless man? Well, I, I've got I've to be conformed to that image, man. And tragic circumstances come up. They're meant, they're meant to put me through the fire to make me more like Jesus Christ and to burn off that dross. That's a problem between him and I. Now, go back to 1 Kings. Uh, you know what? Well, right here, 2 Kings 4, 31. The Bible says this in 31. And, Gehazi, and Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and laid upon the child and put his... This is some of the weirdest stuff, man. I mean, the Old Testament prophets, man, thank God for them. I'm happy in the, in the body of Christ. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. I'm laughing because this stuff is wild, man. And he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. He's doing it again. And the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes. You ever read that before? Get some Kleenex, yo. This is wild stuff. You say, we'll, we'll, we'll get there in a second. And he called Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when he was come in unto, her, unto him, he said, take up thy son. Then she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed herself to the ground, took up her son, and went out. While you're, while you're right here, go back with me to verses 6 and 7. Chapter 4, 6 and 7. Chapter 4, verse 6 says, And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, This is not a vessel, there is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. I don't know if you ever thought about that. How do you not run out? That brings me right to the loaves and the fishes. That's similar thing with the loaves and the fishes. Uh, how, they just never get to the bottom of it. And how do, she never gets to the bottom of the oil. And, oh, oh, and that thing about your son's being uh, given to the creditors, you, can, you have enough to go pay that debt now. No, no. La- last one. Go back to me to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. Verse number 19 says, And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times. So that, that's wild stuff. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him in, unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. All three of them had a triumphant finish. They had tragedy. They had doubt. They had, every, they, they had no man, or if the man they had, he didn't even care. They were just busy doing what they're supposed to do for the Lord. A certain woman a ready woman, a great woman. No name given to him. One of them's called the Shunammite, but other than that, you don't know anything about him. And at the end of them all, what did they get? They got deliverance. Do you know one day that nobody on this earth may know your name, but Jesus Christ knows your name? Do you know that one day you're going to go home to glory and the things you thought amounted for nothing for Jesus Christ because you, you didn't get all the press or the publicity that everybody else got? Jesus Christ is going to say, you did well. 
You stayed faithful and consistent. You were there when I called upon you. You made yourself available. You said you'd go. You said you made yourself ready. You did everything that I, that I asked, and, and I used you, and you were used at the right time, the right moment. Here's a crown or two for you. All, the, all that gold, silver, and precious stones, those are yours too. These women all got triumphant returns at the end of their life all through all that crazy stuff. That's what's headed for you and I one day if you serve the Lord. Don't look for the name down here, folks. Don't look for the... Re don't, if Jesus Christ didn't look for reputation down here, don't look for a reputation. If God gives you some of that, praise the Lord. But the reality is, we're just... You read this morning, we're less than nothing, man. We're grasshoppers. But I'd like to be a grasshopper used to the Lord like these three women were. Brother Burke, pray for us, please. Father, thank you for the work of God, Lord. Thank you that you don't look at things the way we look at. And Lord, thank you that you do elevate and exalt those that humble themselves before you. Amen. Lord, thank you for the examples of these women in the Bible. Lord, help us to learn from them. And Lord, help us to be more like you. And uh, although we don't like any trials and tribulations, Lord, we thank you for them. I pray when they come faithful and you get through us through them so that we can be more like your son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.